Well, hello there and welcome to another exciting episode of Secrets to Real Estate Investing by House Flip Masters. And we have a man with amazing life and business experience today. I'm really excited to welcome him to the show. He just totally intrigued my interest when in some of my preliminary research I learned about him. And he says he went from one and a half million dollars in the bank down to two and a half million dollars in debt. And then he gave his way back to being debt free 13 months later. So with that intriguing story that I can't wait to hear more about, welcome to the show, Paul Moore. Hey, it's great to be here, Holly. Thanks for having me on. Well, why don't you give our listeners a little bit more detail on your life story and, and let's start with you know what you did in college and how you got to where you are today. Okay, great. Well, I had an MBA and an engineering degree. I went to um, Ford Motor Company. I spent five years there and was kind of dying there, even though I didn't know what it meant to be an entrepreneur. I launched out with a partner. We built a staffing firm, which uh, we sold to a publicly traded firm five years later. I was finalist for Entrepreneur of the Year a few times along the way. And um, I went to the Blue Ridge Mountains to raise my kids. Um, in uh, Southwest Virginia, and it was a beautiful place. We started an international student ministry where we were reaching out to international students studying in the U.S. And I'll tell you, um, Holly, semi-retirement at age 35 sounds like a dream, but it was more of a nightmare. I, it was, I was a high-energy entrepreneur. I just had to do something more, so I couldn't sit still. And so um, a friend of mine and I started flipping homes before we'd ever heard of flipping and before uh, Joanna Gaines was famous. And uh, so we flipped dozens of homes, uh, made some pretty good money. And um, then we got into flipping waterfront lots at a resort in the Blue Ridge Mountains called Smith Mountain Lake. We built modular homes. I developed a subdivision had a lot of fun and ignored all the cracks in the ice that said that there was going to be a real estate meltdown. Even though I heard the warnings, I didn't listen. My partners didn't listen. And we found ourselves with, uh, instead of having a million and a half in the bank, where I, when I moved from Detroit, nine years later, I found myself two and a half million dollars in debt. Ouch. Oh my gosh. Well, tell us a little bit more about how you got into that, that debt scenario, because I'm sure you're not the only one that's had to happen mm -hmm. to, and it'd be great for people that haven't had that big payday yet, like you did, to yeah. hear, you know, maybe what not to do or, you know, what happened. Yeah, well, you know, lenders uh, since 1995 up through 2005 or six were really loaning money. I mean, I had a friend with a $40,000 a year income that bought a $620,000 second home. And uh, <laughs> those were the days, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I was able to borrow as much as I wanted. I had some investors as well. Thankfully, we, did, we were able to pay all the investors out. That was important to me. But um, I had a partner, and um, he uh, bailed out after paying these huge interest payments uh, for a while. We could see that the real estate values were tanking. And in late 2007, I found myself $2.5 million in debt with a lot more than $2.5 million in real estate, but it was dropping in price by the day. We couldn't sell it. We had a vacation home, our home, then all these waterfront lots. I had a five-acre tract we couldn't subdivide. And so um, in January 2008, I, um, I had this idea, what would George Mueller do? Do you know who George Mueller is? No, tell me who George Mueller is. George Mueller lived in the 1800s in Bristol, England, and he had an orphanage, and he housed over 10,000 total orphans over the many years he did that. But he wow. actually, he kept meticulous records. They still have vaults of his records recording every penny he spent and every he, penny he brought in, but he never told a single person his needs. He didn't raise funds. He never put... Uh, you know, these, uh, he, he never put out calls for funding. He did it all in faith, and he just trusted that the same providence that got, led him into this, that would take care of these orphans, would also provide all their needs. And so that's what he did. And so I, it's said that he raised $180 million during his lifetime in today's dollars. And um, 
So I thought, Holly, I thought, what, what would he do? Now, first of all, he wouldn't find himself in debt at all. He never would have gone into a penny of debt. But if he would have, what would he have done? And I thought he would just begin to generously give and trust uh, that he would be able to, that that would lead him out of debt. And that's what I started to do. My family thought I was crazy. My friends thought I was really crazy. They thought I needed to, to declare bankruptcy. But that's what we started doing in January 2008. Wow. So you gave your way out of the debt by being very generous, which is counterintuitive for many people, and it worked for you. So that is wonderful. What was the next yeah. step on your path? What did you do next? Well, what happened is in January 2008, um, I met a guy in a Subway restaurant, and it was four weeks into giving, and we were giving a lot every week as if we were making like a million a year, but we obviously weren't. Wow. And um, this guy made an offhanded comment. He was a real smart real estate developer. And he said, have you tried subdividing your land using this obscure law? And I said, oh yeah, no, that won't work. That absolutely won't work. He said, well, what if you tried this? And it was basically turning the law on its head. And so I found myself in the Planning and Zoning Commission um, a few days later. And I, I laid the whole plan out for him and the lady, looks up over her glasses and she says, Mr. Moore, nobody has ever used our law against subdividing to subdivide their land, but you just figured it out. You found a loophole and I won't stop you. I'll, pr I'll approve your plan. So basically, long story short, 13 months later, we were completely debt free and um, we'd even paid off our house in the process. Now, we did a lot of hard work. We spent money, we spent time, we sweat. <laughs> sweat equity but we i know that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't started with generous giving so that's where it started holly yeah it's such a great story and it reminds me of that movie the secret and the big craze of the law of attraction that went around you know years ago and i am such a believer in that more than anything you know activating our reticular activator system yeah. where we become aware of things like I wouldn't expect for you the end of your story to say, oh, millions of dollars dropped from the sky and our problems were solved because we decided to be generous. No, you found a path and you worked really hard, but you were open-minded to it and you recognized a path and it still took a lot of hard work and it had a really good end to your story, which I love. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It was, it was, it was amazing. I'll, I'll never forget it and my four kids will never forget it either. Yeah. So. Think of that audience, the reticular activator system. You, you notice what you are looking for. If you're thinking about a red car or you got, get a red car, suddenly see all the red cars on the road. If you are looking for real estate enhancement, improvement opportunities, you find ways to not only find those, but make things that seemingly wouldn't work, work. Just got to ask the right questions to get to the right answers. Huh? Well, I love that. So sure. what was next on your path? Well, I had had a background in oil and gas, and so the real estate market was still way down. We had a, a, my income and my investments were all in real estate, which wasn't the smartest thing, I guess, but um, we were way down. So we actually began to invest in oil and gas in 2010, and we found out that we went to North Dakota. My business partner has a small jet, and every time we'd fly there, there was no place to stay, and we noticed there were a lot of oil workers staying in pickup trucks along the side of the road at rest stops and parking lots. And so we said, well, we're both in real estate. Why don't we develop something? So we built a very nice high-end multifamily facility to house oil workers. And, you know, Hillary, in middle America, typical rents are about a dollar, dollar fifty a square foot. In other words, a thousand a square foot apartment might rent for let's say a thousand dollars a month through a lot of America. We were renting at thirteen dollars per square foot and keeping it full. We had three hundred square foot really nice rooms uh, efficiencies, and we were renting them out for thirty nine hundred a month, and they were full through the whole. Wow! Of, the whole yeah, I mean that's really interesting. The people were homeless or hotel less not because of lack of funds, they were all making tons of money and it was obviously worth it for them to sleep in their truck to be able to make the money. Yeah. Right. And what a great thing. I mean, that's a true entrepreneurial spirit is you look for a problem and then solve it for a profit if you're doing it right. So great right. job on that one. 
Right, thanks. Yeah, we sold the uh, facility at the top of the market, and that's what led me later into the multifamily business, which I wrote a book about. But before that, uh, we actually plowed a lot of our profits into building a very nice Hyatt hotel. And um, it's one of the nicer ho Hyatt house hotels in America, but probably one of the least profitable because we did a terrible job in market selection. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I now have a podcast called How to Lose Money. Okay, so <laughs> that's fascinating. Tell us more about that. Well, you know what I've found, Holly, is that every successful entrepreneur, executive, and investor has horror stories, or at least really bad stories of losing money along the way. It's things that were done to them, things that they did wrong, mistakes they made. And so we thought, wouldn't it be great to gather all these stories together and teach the younger generation or teach other people not to make those mistakes. So we started this podcast about four months ago. We do two a week and uh, we've had some amazing people on the show. And, you know, maybe you've never had a money loss story, but if you have, we'd love to have you on the show. <laughs> oh, I do. Yes. And it, it's so great that you are sharing that with people of what not to do. You know, like the show that was on cable or whatever that was, what not to wear. You know, what mistakes, learn from other people's mistakes so that you don't have to make them again and yourself. And with today's available information, with free podcasts, everything, I mean, there's so much you can learn without having to go experience the mistakes yourself. So, oh, yeah, right. I have one of those stories, too. I'll have to come share it another time. <laughs> so, well, tell us a little bit more about the Hyatt Hotel or, um, yeah, the Hyatt Hotel. Yeah, so the Hyatt Hotel was, um, we, we built the hotel in another part of North Dakota where there was a much more diverse economy. We thought we were really smart. We were building right across the street from a new hospital that was going in and a uh, Walmart super center and all this. So we broke ground, we built, we got part of it built, and then we started to find out that the neighbors were opposing some of these other commercial facilities and they successfully opposed the Walmart, for example. And oil went from about $100 a barrel down to about 30 And we, um, we did our best to uh, make it work. But uh, honestly, it is not a profitable hotel. And um, it was just a big mistake. And frankly, now one of my huge things, this is five years later now, but one of the huge things I uh, preach to myself and to our staff is market selection. I, I now believe market selection for hotels, for multifamily, uh, etc., is probably about half of the success of any type of commercial um, a real estate venture. You know, venture. Oh yeah, I mean, I can imagine. I, mean, I, I would I would attribute market selection as the big factor in my big money loss story too that's huge very important yeah so um well tell us more about um i don't know if we have talked about this i mean i read about this in your bio but what is this about funding to fight human trafficking tell us a little bit about that too how you got into yeah. that yeah so um about 11 years ago in your part of the world Holly, uh, a guy named uh, Blake started a shoe company that we've all heard of called Tom's Shoes. Yeah. And if any of your listeners haven't heard, uh, when you buy a pair of Tom's Shoes, you um, get to the benefit of having these wonderful shoes, but Tom's Shoes contributes the, uh, one pair of shoes to a needy child in a third world country. Now, to make the analogy a little uh, more understandable, you don't have to share your shoes with that child. You get your own shoes, the child gets theirs, the company foots the bill for that. We were looking at that and we thought, what can we do? What can we do to, to help the world, to change the world? And so what we decided is when an investor invests with our company, we syndicate uh, apartment deals. So we basically are looking for investors. We're pooling together investors to buy large apartments. The investor doesn't have to share their investment profits with anybody else. They get their entire return on investment and we try to give them a, a solid state, safe, stable return. And, um, but we take part of our profits that come from that investor's investment and we 
invest that into something that that investor is passionate about. So when you buy Tom's shoes, you don't get to choose what child in what country gets the shoes, but our investors do. So if they invest, you know, hundred thousand dollars with us or a million dollars with us, we tag that money in our books and then whatever profit we make from that, we give a substantial portion to something that that investor is passionate about as long as it's something we are also passionate about. Well, I'm, I'm sure most investors would pick worthwhile and, and worthy charities. So tell us about the human trafficking. How did you find out about that and get interested in that? You know, um, Holly, human trafficking, uh, take the record year profits of Starbucks, Nike, Apple, and General Motors, their record profits, put them together, double it, and that's the annual revenues of human trafficking right now. Uh, they wow. believe it's over $150 billion a year. Uh, they've enslaved over 21 million people, usually women and girls. And that's, the, that's like the population, the entire population of Pennsylvania and Virginia uh, combined. Wow. And um, so we, uh, if I, Holly, if I was around in the 1830s or 40s or 50s, I would hope and I, I believe that I would have fought to free African Americans. If I would have been an adult um, 60 years ago in the 1950s or 60s, I believe I would have fought for civil rights for African Americans then. This is a crisis similar to those. It's enslaving people of all races on all continents, and it's happening right here in the United States, as you know. So um, I'm committed to fighting this evil and to uh, doing what I can to, uh, to provide funds, to also set the victims free, and basically to give them a home, to give them a safe bed, and to tell them that they're not a worthless piece of junk, but that they are special, and that they were created with a destiny, and that they can, they can come out of the horror that they've, they've been living for all these years. Wow, I, it's something that we don't hear about in the media often. I had no idea it was such a huge problem and I didn't realize there was much going on in the United States even. So do you contribute to a particular um, foundation or charity that works on this? Tell us about that a little bit. Well, this is a perfect example. We've had investors come to us and say, hey, have you heard of this, uh, this one? And so we would open, you know, we would look at the additional ones, but one we like is called Exodus Cry. They're based in Kansas City. And they've produced a film called Nefarious, or Nefarious, however you say it. And um, this film was a documentary that exposed this whole, the wicked underbelly of this industry. So Nefarious is a great documentary. 100% of the proceeds from purchasing that film go to fighting human trafficking. So we like them. We like another one that also happens to be near Kansas City. It's called Harvest Home. And Harvest Home provides housing. They have a 300 plus acre farm where they take trafficked uh, women and girls and they give them a home and rehabilitation and they don't charge a penny for it. So we love both of those. That is wonderful. I'm gonna check out that documentary. It's, as much as it probably will make me cry, I think I need to be more knowledgeable about it and, and let others be more knowledgeable about it because we just live in our happy mm -hmm. little safe bubble our own little sheltered, perfect, happy life, and boy, there's people living with horrors. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing that. That's great, and audience, check out that documentary, Nefarious, and let's um, switch back over to talking more about real estate. All right. Well, I know um, maybe you weren't planning on talking about this, but so many of my listeners are um, kind of new and starting out, and, and maybe, hoping to make some money in real estate, which many of us start out with either wholesaling or flipping. Do you have any um, inspirational stories of some of those flips in your early days that you could share? And, and just to remind you listeners, flipping is how you can make your money that eventually you, you pull up enough that you can invest in multifamily with, with someone like Paul. But um, yeah, inspire us with some of your flipping stories, if you would, and then um, we'll We'll move over into, you know, the opportunities with a company like. Okay, great. 
So um, my friend and I, uh, Jack and I, went to the courthouse steps in Martinsville, Virginia, on a town with 22% unemployment in December of uh, 2000. And we, we went up to the courthouse steps. We didn't take a cashier's check, even though we knew we had to have one to bid, because we just wanted to learn what it was like. Well, we were the only people there on that icy day. And this house that we had evaluated and looked in the windows, it was empty. Uh, we thought it's probably worth $65,000 and they'll probably sell it for 50 or something. Well, we were the only people there and they started the bidding at $34,000. Now, we wow. yeah, and we, so we convinced the auctioneer to go to lunch. I'm serious and come back in half an hour so we could go get a cashier's check for $3,400, 10%. And we bought the house. We closed on it a few days later. Three weeks later, after painting it, cleaning it, uh, and I think we did, we cut the grass or something, we put it for sale by owner sign in the yard about 10 a.m. And by noon, somebody drove by and gave us full price. So oh, we made, wow. <laughs> we made about $24,000 on it. And I thought, wait a minute, this is really good. We can do this maybe 20, 30 times a year. And we can make a lot of money. Of course, your listeners and you and I know it's not usually that easy. We lost money on the next one or two homes. And then we started looking at market selection and thought, Martinsville is probably not the best market. So we, uh, we moved over to a different market. But we had a lot of fun flipping a lot of houses over the years. Yeah. I, and flipping, in my opinion, is always full of opportunities. There's different acquisition methods, lots of differences. You got to be flexible if you're going to stay in it for the long haul. I mean, I've been doing it eight and a half years. So you got to be flexible, but there is great opportunity in it. And the goal for most of us is not to flip forever, although I may do it because I think it's so fun. But you want to amass some money, grow your nest egg, and then you look at more, what should I say, more advanced strategies and techniques. And why don't you tell us about you know, what you're doing now and the opportunities that you provide your investors now? All right, great. Well, um, you, you may realize this, I'm sure you do. In 1995, they changed the law, like we said earlier, to allow almost anybody who wanted to to buy a home. And home ownership shot up from about 64% in the U.S. up to 69.2% by the year 2005. Well, that wasn't such a great idea. And home ownership from 2005 to 2015 dropped back down from 69 to 63% where it stabilized. That drop of 6% represents 6 million new renters into the market. Now, during a lot of those same years, there wasn't a lot of multifamily or single family being built. So there became a supply and demand inequity. In fact, um, multifamily, I was talking to um, a gentleman the other day, Rod Cleef, who you may know, and yeah. uh, Rod said even though he lost $50 million in single family homes in the uh, recession in Florida, his multifamily was still performing well. And it's amazing if you look at the statistics, how low the foreclosure rate was on multifamily in the U.S. during the recession. In fact, Rents actually went up while uh, the rest of the market was tanking. So multifamily is very popular. Some of the underlying reasons are baby boomers who are beginning to rent again. And in most cases, they never go back to owning. Uh, secondly, millennials who want more flexibility are more prone to rent. Plus, they can't usually come up with a down payment. And um, they have a lot of student debt. Third, immigrants generally want to rent, at least at first, more than own. And so this has driven a huge demand in multifamily, which we believe will last for decades. And so, of course, in, capital, in the capitalistic market, uh, the supply will eventually meet the demand. But we believe that there is an opportunity in doing things like rehabbing old buildings like your husband does or in uh, rehabbing old apartments and bringing them up to a modern look and feel and raising the rents and therefore raising the uh, income and the return on investment for our investors. And that's what we do. Wow. So tell me, I mean, obviously I know why you got into it, but what are typical projects that you look for and what's the either number of units and or price point? Give us an idea of what you do now. Yeah. So there are a lot of economies of scale in a hundred plus units. 
And so we're looking for, say, 90 or 100 to up to 200 unit apartments. We're looking for Class B. We're looking for value add opportunities because right now it seems like the cap rate is so, um, it's at such a low level, which means the pricing is so high that that's eventually going to change directions. And when it does, we think the value adds can offset that loss in value that comes from the cap rate expansion. So we're looking for garden style, not high rises, uh, 1970s and 1980s, not, you know, up, properties that haven't been updated that we can update, we can add some modern technology to, we can make it a community, uh, we can put a beautiful playground, dog park, things like that, and uh, basically make this the nicest possible community we can for renters, which is really important to us. At the same time, we want to make it very profitable for our investors as well. Nice. And what um, cities and or states do you look for projects in? So we really like uh, some of the southern states right now. We like the I-85 corridor from Raleigh to Charlotte to Greenville South, Greenville, South Carolina to Atlanta. We like Dallas, Fort Worth. We like Houston, San Antonio. And then there's some other cities like Chattanooga, Knoxville, Nashville, and Birmingham, Alabama that we really gravitate toward as well. Right. Just like well, a lot of other investors. Believe me, it's very hard to find deals there now. What are um, typical cap rates in those areas? Uh, some of those areas are experiencing cap rates in the low fives, like Raleigh-Durham right now. Uh, but typically right now, they're between 5.5% and 6.5% for Class B and C properties. Well, that's better than Los Angeles, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I've heard. Yeah. Well, that's great. I so appreciate your time. As we come to the end, what advice would you give maybe to somebody who's new, who's starting out, who maybe doesn't have, you know, a lot of money, they're new, and, you know, what would you, what would you tell them? You know, I think it's really important uh, to know the difference between investing and speculating. Either one's okay, but... I believe that speculating is, I should say, investing is when your principal is safe and you have a chance of making a return. Speculating, however, is when your principal is not safe and you have a chance of making a return. Now, it's okay to do either one, but Paul Samuelson, the first Nobel Prize winner in economics from the U.S., said investing should be more like watching grass grow or watching paint dry. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. I spent years not understanding the difference between investing and speculating. Investing, putting money down an oil well, there are times when it's kind of safe, but doing wildcat oil investing, which could have a 1,000% return on investment, is very speculative. And building a Hyatt hotel in North Dakota, very speculative. I learned some hard lessons with that, and I really encourage your listeners to understand the difference and put most of your um, cash that you have saved up in investments, not speculation. That's my advice. I love it. Well said. All right, so go ahead and tell our listeners again. Um, well, I mean, I'll say it too. His, his podcast is called How to Lose Money, so go look for that on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Go check that out. He's got some great people on there sharing their life and business experience and take advantage of that. Learn from others so you don't have to repeat those same mistakes. Right. How else can people, oh, and you've got a book. Tell us about your book and your website and how people can learn more from you. I do. Can I do an infomercial for my book? Hi, Please. this is my book. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kidding. It's called The Perfect Investment and just being silly. Uh, the perfect investment, create enduring wealth from the historic shift to multifamily housing. That's available on Amazon or at my website. My website is wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, capital.com. Uh, my address is paul at wellingscapital.com. Fantastic. And we'll have all of that in our show notes in case you didn't get to see it or hear it, write it down. We'll have all that. And Paul, thank you so much. I so appreciate you taking time out of your day to share some of your experiences, which you've had plenty of. 
and help those that are behind you that are still new in the journey. Thank you so much. And if you're interested in learning about investing in multifamily and learning about that from Paul, who certainly knows what he's doing, um, definitely get in contact with him. He'd be a great guy to help you out. So with that, thank you so much. You know, we're always here to guide you to greatness in your real estate investing efforts and to help you have a better life. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Holly. It was great being on. All right. Hey there, thanks for watching the video. Make sure you like it and click subscribe to get notified of more videos. And you can go to hardhatholly.com for a free download on secrets to finding great deals.